I've been living rough for about a year now. It's not as bad as you'd think. Not really. When COVID hit, I lost my job. The food industry got hit pretty hard, and the catering business I worked for had suddenly closed up shop. When I couldn't pay my rent, my landlord put me on the street. I suppose I could have gone and got an assistance check, but I met some guys at a soup kitchen I was crashing at, and they invited me to come live rough with them. For the last nine months, I've been traveling from town to town with a great group of guys who've been homeless for years. I know this makes me sound like a tourist, but it's really not as bad as you'd think. I've been enjoying a freer lifestyle than I ever had before. I travel around with four guys, and they keep an eye on me, and I keep an eye on them. They call me Kid, and I'm lucky to have fallen in with them, all things told. Travis is a vet from Iraq who couldn't seem to live in an apartment after spending six months in an Iraqi prison. He's a rough guy, but very protective of his squad, which I guess is us now. Conley is more like a classic tramp. He's old enough to be my granddad and seems to get by mostly on panhandling. He can be real charming, and he's amiable enough, whether he's drunk or sober. He's more than happy to share what he makes with the rest of us, too. Then, of course, there's John. Of the three, I think John is the one I like the best. He reminds me of my dad somehow. He's tall and thin with bushy eyebrows and a thick salt and pepper beard. He works as a handyman sometimes to make money, and he seems more than content to keep a protective eye on all of us. Despite Conley being 15 years older than him, you can tell that he thinks of all of us as his kids. He was very protective of us, and I spent many nights around a campfire with the three of them. John was always at the head of the fire, like a father at his table, and we often told stories as we hunkered around our camp. On the night in question, we were telling scary stories. We had camped in the woods off the interstate, far enough in that our fire couldn't be seen from the road, and we were eating food we had all bought and telling tales. Conley was talking about a ghost story he had heard in Denver, and Travis told us about a ghost soldier spotted around the barracks he was assigned to in Iraq. I told one of my many creepypastas I'd read during my other life, and finally we looked at John. John was eating quietly through it all, and now seemed intent on continuing his dinner. Your turn, Dad, I said using the teasing nickname I had fixed on him. I don't really like to tell stories, he said, and his voice had a hollow tone to it as he busied himself with his can of stew. Come on, John, said Conley, already sounding like his dinner was affecting him. We all told a story, now it's your turn. I was sitting next to John at his right hand, and I saw him darken a little as Conley prodded at him. Easy, Conley. John doesn't want to tell a story, then he doesn't have to. Fine. You guys want a story? I got a story for you. John sounded a little mad, and Conley raised his hands in a placating way as he told him it was fine. It's a great story. I think you'll love it. Gather up, kids. It's a real doozy. He reached over and took the bottle of rot gut from Conley, taking a deep swig before he started. He sounded flustered, out of sorts, and kind of didn't want him to tell it now. Clearly something was going on here that was outside the norm, and I was afraid of what might happen after his story was told. Wanted or not, though, John began. It was midnight, just like tonight. The August wind was creeping in from the east, cold and hungry, as the two boys sat around their campfire, munching their dinner of beans. They didn't have the luxury of a home or a hearth, only having the other in this world. Their parents had cast them out, not having enough money to feed them any longer, and the two boys had been riding the rails, seeking their fortunes as they tried to make it day by day. The two boys had managed to beg enough for a can of beans, and as they sat around the fire, they listened to the bubbling inside as their stomachs growled and their mouths watered. They hadn't eaten in three days, you see, and the smell of them beans was enough to make them ravenous. They sat closer to the fire, basking in the smell of the cooking beans, and that's when they heard the cry. The two huddled close to the fire, shuddering as the howl glided up between the trees. Their campfire wavered under the torrent of wind, and they hunkered close as they tried to keep alive. They blocked it with their bodies, feeling the icy bite of the wind as they tried to cook their dinner. The howl growled across their shivering skin, and the two boys wondered if that would be their last meal.
the beans began to boil over the lip of the can, and the older boy's threadbare glove to allow him to slide it from the flames. He poured the beans into a tin cup for his brother, gritting his teeth as the heat became too hot even for his gloved hand. As he poured, he could feel something stalking behind them. It had smelled their food and came to look. If they were lucky, it was just a little cat or a mangy dog that would leave if they shouted. If they went, then the older boy would stand against it while the brother ran. Either way, the two would eat a few mouthfuls of beans before they died. He wrapped his scarf around the can gingerly, holding it by the tatty garment as he tipped the scalding beans into his mouth. They burned his tongue and blistered his throat, but his hunger was too great to wait. His brother moaned in pain as he did the same, the two of them feeding their bodies as the scalding food nourished them. And all the while, the beast howled and stalked behind them. Neither boy looked into the dark woods. They knew that something stalked them, that something wanted them desperately. But they thought that if they ignored it, it might just pass them by. As it moved around them, the oldest could see that it was like a dog. It capered about on all fours, its teeth bone white as it grinned at them. It stalked their little fire, circling the pair three times before stopping. It stood between the two, its arrow-shaped head pushed in close. The two boys ate, trying to ignore it, not wanting to see it and hoping it would just go away. When it spoke, the younger of the two began to cry in terror. You come into my woods, bring your destructive fire, and then you don't even offer me a proper gift. What rude children you are, I should punish you for such insolence. The boys begged the creature, saying they had nothing to give, but the creature only scoffed. You should have thought of that before entering my woods. The two boys begged him for mercy, to take pity on two starving children. Mercy is not a trait I ever saw a need to learn. Those who enter my realm bring me gifts. You will present me with a gift, or you will suffer my wrath. He spoke with a sense of refinement that was at odds with his monstrous nature. The boys had still not summoned up the courage to look at him, and now they shuddered against each other as they thought of what to do. The oldest looked at his still warm can of beans in his hand and saw that he had two, possibly three bites of beans left. He held them out to the creature, still not looking at him, and hoped it would be enough. The creature approached, sniffing at the can, and a weight slid into the warm vessel. It slurped as its long tongue lapped at the beans, smacking as it tasted the juice and liking what it found. Lovely. The creature purred, turning its head towards the younger, who had begun to shake. And you? Share with me what is in your cup, little one, and you might be allowed to live through the night. The youngest had his hand over the mouth of his cup, unwilling to move it. His brother told him to give the creature a taste. Then they could leave this place and never come back. The youngest boy shook his head again. The creature put his face very close to the boy and demanded that he remove his hand in a low growl. The boy's shaking hand slid from the cup opening, and the brother felt his stomach drop. The younger boy had wolfed his beans, eating them all, 
and had nothing to show but a cup of juice residue. The older boy could see his tears cutting lines down his dirty face, leaving trails of pink against his skin. He started apologizing hastily and low to the older boy, saying he just couldn't help himself. As the creature asked for his due, the younger could only hold out his shaking empty cup for the beast to inspect. The tongue slid into the metal, making a soupy, gloopy noise as the creature searched for food. And as it slid out, the two heard the creature tutting in disappointment. What a shame. Suddenly, the warmth of the brother's forehead was gone and the forest was filled with the sounds of his younger brother screaming. The older brother curled into a ball, shuddering and weeping as he heard his brother torn to pieces. He closed his eyes and begged God to make it over, but it was some time before the forest was quiet again. He lay there listening to the wind howl, his campfire guttering out as he shivered in the dark, alone. The three of us sat speechless, looking at John as the campfire crackled before him. Out in the woods, an animal loosed a long, mournful howl, and Conley suddenly decided to sleep under the nearby overpass. It's chilly, but at least I won't get et up by no beast. Travis agreed, and the two grabbed their stuff and moved on. Better go join them, John said, poking at the fire as he looked into the flames. Sounds like an old friend is looking for his due. I heard something in his words I didn't like. Something akin to a suicidal friend telling you it's fine to leave them alone. But I got up and followed the others anyway. The last time I saw John, he was still staring into the flames. We looked for him the next day, but he was nowhere to be found. We found the old campsite. We found his pack. But of John, there was no sign. By midday, we just assumed he had left, and we moved on. I'm still not entirely sure what happened to him, but if you meet John on the road somewhere, tell him his troop misses him. And if you meet the creature from his story, I hope you saved it some beans. Otherwise, you might discover what really happened to John on that windy December night by the interstate. It was just supposed to be a typical camping trip with my scout troop. My friends and I were so excited, Davey, Kevin, and I. We always look forward to these camping trips, and the yearly autumn campout was one of the best. We took a bus to Grayson Falls, a huge state park with so many lakes to swim in, trails to hike, and several caves to explore. All the local scout troops would be there, ten in all, and we would meet in Starfall campgrounds for the Jamboree. There would be canoe races and s'mores and, of course, the annual Scary Story Contest. All three of us have been crafting our stories since the last Jamboree, and this year we were ready to take that prize. As the bus pulled up to the campsite, we all spilled out of it excitedly. We were the first to arrive, the others getting there tomorrow, but Scoutmaster Larry had wanted us to get there early so we could get the best spots. As I stood in the center of the campground, watching the other scouts mill about, going about their preparations and such, I couldn't help but soak in the sounds and smells of the surrounding forest. Grayson State Park had always been my favorite place to camp, and it was chiefly because it exuded this energy of safety and adventure. It was a maintained park, the park rangers keeping the animals in check and the forest peeled back from the areas where hikers and campers stayed. Even so, it wasn't too hard to imagine a wolf or a bear watching you from the tree line, just waiting to pounce on you unexpectedly. It wasn't too far-fetched to think that something mysterious or unknown could be lurking in those woods as well. We set up our tent a little further back than the others. Scoutmaster Larry had given us a set area where we could pitch our tents, and we had set our own tents at the edge of this. We wanted to feel like real scouts, like trailblazers, and I imagined us like old-timey explorers as Kevin and I set up our tents. Davy had disappeared, and I assumed he was getting water or firewood or something. No sooner had I set up my tent, though, than Davy hissed at us from the woods. Nice campsite, but follow me if you girls want to do some real camping. He motioned us into the woods. 
But, but Scoutmaster Larry said, Kevin stammered, who cares what Scoutmaster Larry said? Do you want to camp or what? We looked at each other. I did feel pulled by adventure, and Kevin, despite being kind of a wet blanket, seemed to feel it too. We nodded, and Davy set out his plan. We would leave our tents here as decoys, since they were already set up, and move off into the woods. Davy knew of a place where we could set up his tent, and we could do some actual camping for the night, away from the adults and the other scouts. It would be like camping on our own, being explorers and roughing it for real. But what if they come looking for us? Kevin asked. Davy just waved his hand at the question. We'll go back to eat, and then after dinner, we'll head back to the site. We'll wake up before anyone else gets good and stirring tomorrow, and be back in the camp before anyone notices. I had to admit, it wasn't a bad plan. We would strike our camp after tonight, and rejoin the jamboree tomorrow as the others arrived. No one would miss us for one night, not with so many other scouts around. Kevin and I agreed to go look at the campsite first, wanting to see where he had put it before committing to staying the night there. As we plunged into the forest, Davy led the way. We took no trail, our feet following new ground as they led us to the campsite. As we went, I felt as though I could feel something watching us. It was still early afternoon and the forest was alive with the sounds of nature, but this tickling on the back of my neck felt a little sinister somehow. I turned to glance around as we went, but I saw nothing more dangerous than a blue jay or a squirrel. I decided I was being silly, and caught up with Kevin and Davy as we headed for our secret campsite. Even Kevin had to admit that the campsite was pretty cool. It was set in a small clearing, and complete with a fire pit that led me to believe that other scouts had used this site before. His tent almost looked out of place here, and I could just imagine scouts before us sleeping under the stars in sleeping bags. Davy asked us what we thought, and I could see that both of us were sold on the idea. We had agreed to come back after dinner, and thus we returned to the group. The rest of the day went fairly uneventfully. We returned to find a hike about to begin, so we tagged along as Scoutmaster Larry showed us nature's glory. We were a little nervous that they might happen upon our campsite, but the hike took us around the nearby creek and up to a natural waterfall that led from the lake nearby. As we returned, Scoutmaster Larry had our dinner cooking on a small fire near the counselor's tent. We set about preparing for the meal, and soon we were all stretched out on the grass eating campfire stew and hardtack bread. As we ate, Scoutmaster Larry laid out the day's events for tomorrow's jamboree. It would be a whole day of canoe races, decathlon contests, and all of it capped off by the scary story reading and the s'more roast. All of us were chattering quietly as we headed off to bed, the sun setting behind us as the three of us pretended to head to our tents. As the sun set low, we moved into the woods and made our way to our campground. As we followed Davy into the woods, I began to hear something strange in the surrounding green. It started as an overriding noise, making Kevin and Davy hard to hear even at close proximity. Davy was too excited to even acknowledge it at first, but I saw Kevin shooting furtive looks into the surrounding woods. The sounds of the forest seemed to be higher than I had ever heard them, and the deeper we went, the louder it seemed to become. The birds sounded like a flock, squawking and chattering animatedly to each other, and many of them sounded like species not even native to the region. As scouts, we were taught to identify local birds. It's for a badge, and many of these sounded different from the finches and quails you usually heard this time of year. I heard deer grunting and the yowls of cats, the growls of a bear, and even the throaty howl of a wolf. The strangest thing of all is, it wasn't the sound or the presence of non-native animals that had me scared. The strangest thing was that each cry was exactly the same. Same sound, same volume, same everything. The others could hear it too, but they were pretending they couldn't for some reason. We could all hear the sounds of animals, all of them much too loud. Kevin was starting to cry. Davy kept insisting that once we made it to the campsite, everything would be okay. He was pulling Kevin along now, Davy's hand wrapped around his wrist. Kevin was nearly frozen with fear, and I could see his eyes shining as he was half drugged through the trail. When we reached the tent, we all went straight in, not daring to even start a fire. We huddled in our tent, Kevin hyperventilating, as Davy and I peeked through the flap. The forest was still very loud, very populated, but it seemed to stop at our campsite. It was like a song heard from behind a door. You know the song, but the words are muffled. We watched the woods, both of us agreeing that we couldn't go back. We would have to stay the night, and Davy thought that we should probably sleep in shifts, too. There's definitely something out there. If we sleep in shifts, we can catch it if it tries to sneak up on us. I agreed, but for the moment, the two of us just watched the woods. The noises were moving away, 
like a troop of actors on the move, and Kevin came to join us as well. We spent an hour just watching the woods, and I was surprised when I looked over to find Kevin snoring in the corner. The adrenaline was kicking out, and we were all getting tired. I told Davey I was going to lie down as well, but I just couldn't get comfortable. I was so tired, but my mind wouldn't shut off. I lay there, angrily tossing for what felt like hours, and that was probably why I heard them. I had just started to doze off when the first of the voices scraped across my senses. I woke up to find Davy and Kevin stirring, roused by the voices outside the tent as well. They were familiar voices, campers and scoutmasters we knew, all of them calling our names. They were out in the woods at night searching for us, and their voices clattered through the dark wilderness in a jarring way. They were too loud somehow, disturbing the perfect silence of the night. They also seemed wrong, like the animal sounds from earlier. Each of them was the exact same name, called in the exact same way, again and again. Davy opened the tent, looking out into the darkness for a flashlight. The forest was still dark, the crickets and the night birds alarmingly silent. The quiet of the night was disturbed only by the yelling searchers, and the sounds of their voices were making my skin crawl. Kevin seemed shaken as the voices grew closer and closer. Maybe, maybe we should just go to them, guys. They're... They're going to be mad if they find us out here. We should just say we were out here using the bathroom or something. His voice shook as he said it, and I could tell he was getting ready to bolt. Kevin was the type who feared getting in trouble more than silly things like possible death. Davy turned away from the flap to look at him. Are you crazy? If we stay right where we are, they'll never find us. Kevin didn't seem so sure, though. As we stood at the tent flap, watching the woods and listening to the voices... Kevin made a sound like a wounded cat and made a break for the woods. He shoved past us and went running into the brush, yelling that he was sorry for making them look for him. We heard him apologize up until his yells were suddenly cut off. He was stammering apologies one minute, and the next, he was silent as the grave. Davy and I stood looking out into the woods, shuddering in the sudden stillness that held sway across the dark green world. Then, as suddenly as they had stopped, the voices began again. We could hear Kevin's voice amongst them, calling for us to come out. Davy, I said, both of us still looking out into the woods, my eyes having just realized something my brain should have a long time ago. If they're out there looking for us, why don't they have flashlights? Davy contemplated this, and it seemed to scare him just as much as it scared me. We went back inside, huddling in our tent as the voices grew closer and closer. Davy zipped up the doorway and walked backwards into the suddenly flimsy canvas tent. He seemed afraid to turn his back to the doorway and just sort of stood in the middle as he kept his eyes fixed on the secured opening. I hunkered in my sleeping bag, listening to the voices call our names as they came closer and closer. Davy shuddered, cocking his head like a dog who hears a noise. He suddenly took a step back towards the door, and I yelled at him to get away from there. I hunkered down in my sleeping bag, hearing the voices calling our names, and my tears were wet as they slid nakedly down my face. We were trapped out here, alone, with no one to help us. Why hadn't we just stayed with the others? I sunk deeper into my bag, hoping I would wake up to find out this had all been a dream and feel silly for letting it scare me. I opened my eyes as the zipper door slid open. I looked out to find Davy standing in the doorway, looking at the voices that seemed to surround our tent. I begged him to close it, begged him to come back, but he only glanced back at me, almost apologetically. The moon cast his face in stark relief, turning him into a carved totem, and then he turned and stepped out into the night. He left the tent open, and I heard him scream as whatever was calling to us got him. His scream was high and long, cutting through the monotonous calling like an axe through a melon. It cut off at the peak of his terror and the sound of it ending made me bunch down in the sleeping bag all the more. The next time I heard his voice was when it joined that frightening chorus, all of them now calling for me. I put my hands over my ears, trying to block them out. I wanted them to stop. I wanted this all to be over, and I sat shuddering, suddenly becoming aware that I couldn't hear anything. I pulled my hands away from my ears, slowly at first, and heard nothing but the silence of the outside night. I looked at the flap of the tent, and found only the soft rustle of the fabric against the zipper as I began to worm my way out of my warm cocoon. I got about half out when suddenly they were all around me. Their hands pushed at the walls of the tent, 
Their faces were canvas-covered masks as they tried to push their way inside. I could see their terrible features and hear their ragged breathing as they all shoved at the thin barrier of my tent. There were so many of them. Adults, children, animals, and others who resembled nothing so much as skeletons with vaguely human shapes. A shadow fell onto the floor of my dwelling, and I looked to see one framed in the doorway. I zipped my sleeping bag shut then and hunkered down at the bottom, a snail trapped inside its shell. Outside I could hear the monotonous voices surrounding me again, moving in for the kill as I shuddered at the bottom of my sleeping bag. When I heard the metallic zipper, I knew I was done for. The creature sank its face into the mouth of the sleeping bag, and I cowered as its bony lips peeled back in a mirthless smile. It opened its mouth. It screamed my name, lunging at me with its bony teeth, its pale white skull luminescent in the darkness. I died with the sound of my own name fighting against the rippling scream that rode up my throat. The scouts around the fire looked at me as though I was from another planet. The campfire was the only sound, the logs crackling merrily as the collected troops sat looking at me as I stood in the story circle. Even some of the scoutmasters looked a little rattled by my story, but slowly they started to clap. Scoutmaster Larry clapped the loudest, shaking his hand as he approached. Now I see why you wanted to go last. That would have been a hard story to top. I think we can agree which story wins this year's Jamboree Short Story Contest. The applause picked up then, and Davy slugged me in the arm as I sat back down. Can't believe you kept that to yourself all week. I thought Kevin was going to pee his pants. Was not, Kevin said petulantly, though he looked a little pale, nonetheless. I smiled. Storytelling was something I was good at, and it was always nice to be recognized for my talents. I let my mind slip into the woods around us, hearing the call of a night bird and the whimper of the wind. Perhaps there was something like that out in the woods of the state park. Who could say what lurked in the deep pockets that surrounded areas made for man? I felt myself shiver a little as the wind pushed a sound across my senses. A lonesome sound that sounded eerily like my name. My audience might not be the only one having trouble sleeping tonight. Yeah, it's just me here tonight, I said as I washed up a few dishes. The darkness outside seemed held at bay by the big floodlight on the pole. The forest surrounding our little cabin looked like a green wave that was preparing to swallow our circle of humanity up forever, and it was only thanks to that 120-watt bulb that we were saved. I had the phone pressed against my ear, and I laughed as my boyfriend said something funny. The phone slipped towards the soapy water, and I caught it just in time as something scratched at the door again. What? Nah, they haven't come home yet. Uncle Ricky doesn't usually like to be out in the woods after dark. I opened the back door as another loud scratch came from it, and Benji walked in. The mutt had been with our family for years, and as he lumbered in, he wagged his tail and gave me a big doggy grin. I wrinkled my nose with disgust when I noticed that he'd been rolling in something. There was red-brown crust all over his right side, and at first I mistook it for blood. When I saw he wasn't limping, though, I figured it was just mud, or worse, blood off of some carcass he'd rolled around in in the woods. I started after him as he made his way towards the laundry room where his food bowls were, my boyfriend prattling away in my ear. Rick, I'm going to have to call you back, I said, making my way towards the laundry room before Benji could roll around on the clean laundry. Everything okay, babe? Yeah, but Benji rolled in something, and I don't want him to get it all over the house. Okay, well, stay safe. Love you. Love you too, Rick. See you tomorrow. I hung up the phone and took a step towards the laundry room. I had just reached for the bristle brush by the sink when my phone blared from the countertop. I turned away from Benji and walked towards the phone, checking the caller ID to see who it was. Brad's smiling face was plastered across the screen, and I picked it up on the third ring. I figured it would be them telling me they were on their way and running late. I didn't get three words out, however, before I was immediately buffeted by a wall of static and Brad's frantic voice yelling as he cut in and out. I held the phone a little away from my ear, like it might explode. Hello? Oh God, thank God, Rach. I need you to call the sheriff right now. His tone was equal parts terror and fury, and I was immediately worried. What happened? Is everything okay? Uncle Ricky's hurt pretty bad, and Dad's not in the best shape either. Dad says to call the sheriff and get an ambulance. Lock the door until we get there. 
Brad, what, what happened? What d- Do it, Rachel. We'll be there in five minutes. Don't open the door for anyone until we get there. Then he hung up on me, and I was left looking at the silent brick. I tried the sheriff's office, but the phone just rang and rang before connecting me with static. The phone number for the ambulance did the same, and by this point, I was starting to get scared. Was there a problem with the phones in town? Had some disaster happened out in the woods that spilled over into town? As I went to lock the door, I saw the familiar headlights of Dad's old pickup coming up the driveway. I flung it open instead and went to help them. Dad came out of the back, hoisting Uncle Ricky under the arm, and Brad hopped out of the driver's seat and ran over to help him. Uncle Ricky hung limply between them, and I could see at a glance that he was not in good shape. His flannel shirt and jeans were covered in blood, and though it was hard to tell, I thought his left arm might be gone. Dad was covered in blood too, but it looked like some of it might be Uncle Rick's. He had four long claw marks running through his left eye, and it was swelling too badly for me to tell if the eye still worked. Brad shouted at me to get the door, and I complied as all three of them came running into the living room. In the light, it was easy to tell how bad Uncle Rick was. His arm was gone. The sleeve had been used to make a tourniquet around the stump, and his breathing was shallow as he lay on the couch in a state of unconsciousness. Brad said something about getting back for the guns, but Dad shut him down and sent us both to lock the doors. After the house was secure, Dad asked me if I'd called the sheriff or the ambulance. I told him about the strange static, and he swore loudly as he took his own cell phone out of his pocket. He dialed a number, and I could tell by his face that he was getting the same result. Finally, he swore and threw the phone against the wall. I guess we're on our own, he said, and it was the most hopeless sound I'd ever heard come out of my daddy. Even when Mama died, he'd still kept a strong face on for us. What's going on? What happened to Uncle Rick? I asked. Dad looked over at Brad, and after a silent conference, Dad started to tell it. We'd been hunting for most of the day. We hadn't caught a damn thing. Something was scaring the game off. We heard it walking around a few times and thought it was a bear. Your Uncle Rick said it smelled like a bear. So when the sun started going down, we decided it was time to pack it in. We started getting everything together. Right out of the blue, a doe steps out in the meadow. She looked around real skittish-like and starts cropping grass real quick. She clearly smelled whatever had been making that noise all day. But the deer has to eat and she started filling her belly as quickly as she could. Your uncle sided her up and dropped her real easy, and we figured at least we'd have one thing to show for our efforts. No sooner did we get to the edge of the meadow when a big old something comes crashing out. It grabbed our deer and bolted back into the woods like a bat out of hell. It kind of looked like a bear, I guess. The sun was setting, and it was hard to tell, but it moved quicker than any bear I'd ever seen. Brad and I were just going to let it go, but Rick was mad as I'd ever seen him. He tore off after it, saying he was going to take that thing home instead. So we follow him, not wanting to leave him in the woods alone after dark, and we chase this thing into its cave. At that point, I was sure it was a bear, so we go creeping in, trying to surprise it. As the sun sets behind us, we see this thing hunkered over the deer, and it weren't no bear. It's wolfing at the deer, just slurping down big mouthfuls, and Rick gets real pale and starts gibbering about how it's the thing that we saw when we were kids. Wait, I interrupted. You've, you've seen this thing before? Dad looked perturbed, but nodded. Yeah, that's why Rick hated to go into the woods after dark. When we were teenagers, we were up in a stand hunting deer. Rick sights one before sunset, and he drops it, much like we had tonight. We're about to go get it when this big thing comes out of the woods and starts wolfing it down right there in the meadow. Well, you know your Uncle Rick. He always had a temper. So he pops off a shot at it. Hits it too, but that don't do nothing but piss it off. It comes roaring and charging up to the bottom of our tree and starts clawing and pushing until it topples it over. We jump out just as it hits the ground and just go tearing off running for the truck. And that was what you saw today. Well... Dad hedged. It was almost dark when we shot the deer, and we never got a good look at it. All I know is that's what chased us out of the woods, and Rick wouldn't go hunting with us for the next three years after that. He paused for a minute to make sure I was out of questions before continuing his story. 
So with Rick gibbering, this thing looks up and sees us. I swear to you that it came up on its hind legs and walked like a man as it ran at us. Rick pops a shot off, probably just panic fire, but it just shrugs it off and lands on him. I saw his arm, rifle and all, go into its mouth, and I heard it crunch as it bit it clean off. Rick starts screaming, and we all start yelling. Before it can finish him off, though, Brad and I pepper it four or five times with buckshot. It must have dazed it because it rolled off a Rick with a loud shriek and stumbled back towards the cave. It sounded like a man screaming, Brad said, and Dad nodded before going on. It starts flailing around in pain, and we grabbed Rick and start dragging him back towards the truck. This thing came after us, and it sounded like it was crashing through the trees the whole way. We couldn't move very fast. Each of us had an arm under Rick as we drug him along, and I swear it would have had us if it hadn't been for Benji. My blood suddenly ran cold. Benji? Yeah. Poor little guy. He's been with us the whole time. He didn't seem to want anything to do with that thing but when it jumped on us again and raked my face he started growling and lunges right at it i hear them tearing and snarling at each other and we just high-tailed it back to the truck it's a wonder we ever found it in the dark poor old benji he sacrificed himself so we could get away both brad and my dad looked forlorn but i just shook my head no he didn't he's right here dad gave me a funny look what are you talking about? He came wandering in not long before you guys did. That's when I remembered the blood on his fur. There was no way he could outrun the truck. Hell, the only reason I hadn't questioned it was because I had forgotten he had gone with him. I looked back towards the kitchen door, and it creaked open as Benji's friendly grin poked through the gap. He strolled into the living room, his fur still a mess of blood and mud, and glanced around the room as his tail wagged and his big old doggy smile stretched across his face. When he stepped up on his hind legs, I thought for sure I was dreaming. Benji leapt across the living room, and when he hit the couch, he was no longer the cuddly mutt we'd all come to love. He was 200 pounds of sleek black fur and raking claws that reduced my family to a spray of blood and screams of mercy. I fell back from the scene, covering my eyes with my hands to block it all out. I could still hear every bone-wrenching yank, every blood-splattering swipe, and every watery gurgle as my family had their throats torn out. I was numb. My mind shrank away from the scene before me as I backpedaled until my back hit the wall of the cabin. I curled my knees up to my chest and put my head against my knees as I sank to the floor and waited for it to be over. I didn't care at that moment whether I lived or died, I only wanted it to end. I could feel myself crying as the living room became a killing field. And when it finally ended, I could hear the overpowering bray of my explosive sobs. My sobs stopped when I heard heavy footsteps walking towards me. I didn't look up. I didn't want to look up. But when the creature's hot breath puffed against the top of my head, I pulled my face away from my knees despite myself. His blood-smeared face was inches from mine, and I quickly buried my face against my knees again. It was leaning over me, my family's blood pattering onto my skin, and it was all I could do not to pass out from terror. We stayed like that for several minutes, until I couldn't take it anymore. I lifted my head and looked at this semi-feline face and asked the question, Why, why haven't you killed me yet? His voice was high like a bee that's been caught in a jar, and it hurt my ears to listen to him. Because you helped me. For that favor, I will give you a favor in return. Leave my woods before sunset tomorrow, and I will allow you to continue to exist. Stay, and you will share the fate of your kin. Then he turned and walked out of the house on two legs. I was gone before the sun came up. I threw my clothes in a bag, took the pickup my brother had been careless enough to leave the keys in, and drove. My phone rang a few times, but I ignored it. The hardest, the hardest was when Aunt Clara called, but after three days, even she stopped calling. They likely assumed I was dead, too. I sold the truck before I left the state and haven't looked back. I drove until I couldn't see the forest anymore. I drove until... 
I couldn't see three trees grouped close enough to obscure anything. And when the desert stretched out before me, I finally stopped. I'll, I'll make my life here now. I have no intention of ever leaving the desert again. I don't, I don't know what forest this creature calls its own, and I never want to find out. Good evening, my little creeperonies. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's reading. If you'd like to support the show, we've got a Patreon going on. $5 patrons have their names read out at the end of every video, so if you'd like to be the first one, follow that link and be a Patreon supporter. Or you could always buy one of my books. I'll leave a link to my latest on Amazon, Dark Journeys. And as always, we thank you for your patronage, and we thank you for stopping by. This is Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening. It was a night just like this. Six campers were out with their scoutmaster on an overnight camping trip. They were just settling in after a long day of hiking when suddenly they heard it. A wailing coming from the forest that chilled them to the bone. They had all heard of the woods witch. Everyone around here had heard of the woods witch. They all knew how she lured all those children into the forest so long ago. They all knew about the search party that had heard screams echoing through the woods that night as they searched in vain for their lost kids. And, of course, they all knew about how they found Chimney Cave full of bones and half-eaten bodies of the missing children she'd taken. They also knew how the townspeople buried her alive after setting fire to her den inside that cursed cave. They didn't believe the legends about the Woods Witch, how she still haunted the woods and killed anyone foolish enough to stay there after dark. They unwisely went to sleep, huddled down in their sleeping bags, and tried to ignore the eerie moaning that came echoing from the woods. Then they heard it. Deep in the night, the wailing getting closer and closer to their campsite. The scouts couldn't sleep. They huddled in their sleeping bags as the wailing grew closer and closer. They heard the trees shake and the leaves crackle as the wailing came closer and closer. They added their fearful cries to the wailing as it grew closer and closer until finally we all jumped but none of us jumped higher than Reggie Bobby grinning like an idiot as he stood at the edge of the firelight pointed and laughed at the wet spot on the front of Reggie's shorts his cretinous little friends joined in but I just sighed and shook my head every day with this bunch I swear Look, guys, Wedgie had a little accident. Bobby cawed laughter as his other two meathead friends laughed along with him. Mark and Kyle weren't much higher in the brains department than Bobby, but they knew enough to laugh when he laughed. Otherwise, they might find themselves at the end of a beating. I looked at Reggie and sighed. How did a kid like Reggie get roped into the Boy Scouts? I had been with the Scouts for about three years now. And I think if my dad hadn't been so serious about me staying, I would have left after the first week. I know it doesn't seem like much, kiddo, but if you just climb the ranks, maybe even stay until middle school, it'll look good on a college transcript one day. You gotta think about those extracurriculars while you're young, he said with all the weight of a man handing down a cosmic truth. Yeah, thanks, Dad. After three years of being in a four-man scout troop with Bobby Terry and his idiot friends, all I had to show for it was some knot tying knowledge and the ability to identify poison oak. The last three years had also been filled with Bobby and his friends trying to tease and bully me and me ignoring them until they stopped, only to start up again a little while later. The scoutmasters we had tried to hold our attention, but the three of them were more intent on making everyone else's life a living hell than learning about knots or birds or whatever. In a way, it had been a blessing when Reggie joined. Reggie was this overweight kid with glasses and a fear of everything. He had transferred into my troop about a month ago. 
Reggie and his mom had just moved into town, and even though he'd been in the scouts before, he seemed pretty pathetic at most everything. The only thing he seemed to excel at, and even I felt a little bad about thinking it, was being a big fat target for Bobby and his friends. I felt sorry for him, of course, as he sat there in his chocolate-stained uniform and his discolored shorts that had been peed in one too many times. Still, it was also kind of nice to get a break from Bobby and his constant need to torment someone. Since Reggie had come along, I had been all but invisible to their kind, and I kind of liked it. Scoutmaster Mike, our designated grown-up for this trip, sighed and glared at Bobby. Bobby Terry, if you don't calm down, I'm going to call your father and tell him to come pick you up. Is that what you want? Bobby stopped laughing. Bobby's father was the only thing that seemed to take the wind out of his sails. Mr. Terry was a beefy car mechanic with no neck and big scarred hands that always made me think he beat the cars into submission before fixing them. He always showed up to get Bobby at the end of meetings in his ratty old blue Ford, wearing his faded blue jumpsuit with Terry stitched on it and a slim cigar poking out of his mouth. He always growled around that cigar to tell Bobby to get the hell in the truck, I'm missing my dinner. It had been unanimously decided, my dad once told me, that Bobby's dad didn't have to chaperone scout outings, and this seemed to be just fine with Mr. Terry. Reggie sniffed and stood up sheepishly. Mr. Mike, I think I, think I need to change my pants. Scoutmaster Mike blew out a long, horsey breath. Go ahead, Reggie. The rest of you go get ready for bed. We have a long hike to Chimney Cave tomorrow, and I don't want to hear about anybody being tired tomorrow morning. Lights out in 20. And with that, he set about getting the campsite ready for bedtime, as we shuffled into the big six-man tent we'd all be sharing. It wouldn't do any good to argue with Scoutmaster Mike. He wasn't an ideal Scoutmaster, and arguing usually just got you a locked tent flap as he sat in his tent and ignored you. Of course, he wasn't supposed to lock his tent, but my dad told me that Mr. Mike had this weird fear of bugs crawling into his tent at night, so we always ensured his tent was secured with a lock from the inside. I flopped down onto my sleeping bag as Mark, Kyle, and Bobby arranged their bags close enough that they could see what Bobby had brought. I took out my lamp and a copy of Lord of the Rings as I settled in for a little reading before bed. Reggie came into the tent a few minutes later, wearing a pair of pajama bottoms with cartoon characters on them. He smelled slightly of urine, and when he pitched his bag towards the other end of the tent, I was silently glad. The other three boys were gathered around Bobby's sleeping bag, ignoring Reggie for once. Bobby had taken some of his father's dirty magazines, and now that their tired game of pick on the fat boy had ended, they were content to ogle the glossy pictures. Reggie crawled into his sleeping bag, looking for all the world like a giant green caterpillar. I went back to my book, losing myself in Tolkien's world of elves and orcs and magic rings, when it became apparent that Scoutmaster Mike wasn't going to yell at us to turn the lights off, and no one was going to opt for an early bedtime. I rolled over and went to sleep. The following day, Scoutmaster Mike didn't come out for breakfast. We banged on his tent and tried to get his attention, but he wouldn't come out. The cooler with the food was in his tent, so we started getting restless after a breakfast of granola bars, water, and trail mix. We were supposed to go on our hike to Howling Cave today, and as the morning crept closer to midday, we all began to get pissy as small children are wont to do. Finally, Bobby shouted that he had just cut the tent open and see what was taking Scoutmaster Mike so long. After he failed to find his pocket knife, though, the threat stopped being so threatening. I, for one, was pretty glad he had lost it. Nothing in these woods frightened me as much as Bobby Terry with a knife. Finally, at around 10.30, Bobby announced that we should all just pack up and go to Howling Cave ourselves. Without Mr. Mike? Reggie asked, a stutter creeping into his voice. Oh no, Reggie! I guess you're white. We can't go without him. Gee, maybe we'll just roll his tent along behind us so he can sleep and chaperone us. Guess without him, stupid. It's not like all of us haven't been there before. This was technically true. When we were first year scouts, we had all camped here. Scoutmaster Eddie had taken us up to Howling Cave and let us explore it a little. 
I remember being disappointed, because none of us found out why it was called Howling Cave. At the age of six, I thought it was because wolves lived there, and I wanted to find one so I could keep him as a pet. Bobby had also pushed Kyle off a rock shelf while horsing around, so we had to leave before exploring all the tunnels. If we went by ourselves, though... I put a few things in my pack, and as Bobby and his friends headed out, I tagged along behind them. Bobby noticed me at once. You coming too, Squints? He asked, bringing out his old nickname for the occasion. Long as you don't get lost, I guess, I said. We hadn't gone far when a loud, running, huffing figure came up to join us in our travels. Reggie had thrown on his bulging knapsack, and it looked like he was prepared for a week on the Appalachian Trail. His mother had packed half a pharmacy and two-thirds of a Sears camping department into it. He was now running after us like the devil himself was in pursuit, clanking and shaking all the while. Bobby sneered at him, but replaced the sneer with a big cheesy grin when he came blustering up to join us. Oh good! You made it, Wedgie! This hike just wouldn't be the same without you, he said in a saccharine sweet voice. The rest of the hike was spent with Bobby and his friends having a whispered conversation that I did not like. Despite what I'd said earlier, there was no chance of us getting lost. We may not have been in a state park or anything, but Howling Cave doubled as a trailhead for a branch of the Appalachian Trail, and there were markers all along the way. The hike was an easy one, half a mile up to the cave on fairly level terrain through the cool shadows of the woods. Bobby and his friends led the way, and Reggie and I were relegated to picking up the rear as we went along. I had expected Reggie to slow us down, or start whining like he usually did, but he kept pace somehow, and seemed pretty comfortable as we rolled along. Even so, there was sweat standing out on all of us by the time we got to Howling Cave. The entrance yawned like a hungry mouth, and as we stepped into the coolness of the cavern, we were plunged into near darkness in no time. Flashlights winked on, and we swept them around the big entrance cave, the ceiling hanging like a waiting predator. The beams fell on a series of tunnels. The tunnels were called the roots, and the cave we were in was called the trunk. Many of the trails met up and cut back to the trunk, with only a few of them ending in dead ends. A ranger, or whoever was in charge of keeping the bears and things out of this popular tourist destination, had nailed a plaque up on the wall that showed the tunnel's various routes and intersections. We were all looking at the map when we heard the wail. It was otherworldly, like a banshee's cry, and it seemed to slice through the trunk like a knife through butter. We all looked up at the sound, and Reggie wasn't the only one who looked a little scared. We all stood perfectly still for a count of five, before Reggie voiced what we were all thinking. What what was that? Maybe, Bobby said, a sly grin stretching his face. It was the woods witch who lives in this cave. She smelled your dinner rolls and got hungry, Wedgie. Bobby turned suddenly and grabbed a double handful of the boy's large and overflowing gut. Reggie screamed and tried to pull away, but Bobby had him in a firm grip and cackled madly as he pinched and pulled at the fat rolls. Reggie finally pulled away, and as he stumbled, sobbing to the stone floor, I found myself reaching to help him up. Knock it off, Bobby, I said already tired of this crap. Can't you stop being a jerk for five seconds? Bobby ooed comically. Look here, guys. I think Squints found himself a boyfriend. They laughed, but I ignored them as we started down the closest trail. Anything to get away from Bobby and his little asshole brigade. I wasn't surprised when Reggie tagged along. The fat boy kept pace behind me easily, but I ignored him as we walked. I took paths at random, pretending to look at the cave formations and other natural wonders as they fell into my flashlight beam. We walked in silence for a while, the tunnels becoming slightly claustrophobic, before he thanked me for standing up for him. I guess no one had ever really stood up for Reggie before, because he seemed unsure of himself as he tripped over his hastily constructed thank you. That, that Bobby is a real, a real asshole, he finished, and then covered his mouth like he'd committed blasphemy. I laughed a little. I couldn't help it. He can be. Just stand up for yourself. Maybe he'll stop. Reggie chuckled. <laughs> Maybe he'll rip my head off, he said, his voice low. We came to a fork in the path, and Reggie looked sheepishly at me. I, I have to pee. Will you wait for me? He asked. I nodded, and he went down the left-hand pathways until I couldn't see him anymore. As I stood there waiting, 
that stupid noise howled through the cave again, and it spiked every hair on the back of my neck. What the hell is that? I thought to myself. Far from being scared, it made me curious. Caves don't naturally scream. Woods witches are not. So while I was sure the howling was how the cave had got its name, I found myself wondering how it made the noise that gave it such an ominous title. I was still wondering when suddenly and unexpectedly, a tall humanoid shape lumbered from the darkness ahead and screamed at me. A beam of light lit its face some five feet in the air, and I stumbled and fell backwards onto the stone floor. I scrambled back on my hands and butt and felt my palms open up as the creature walked towards me. It let out another ear-splitting howl as it towered over me and I sat on the stone floor. All I could think to do was turn my flashlight on it and see what was going to kill me before it devoured me, my beam shaking a little as it revealed them. That's when the creature started laughing, and I realized that it was just Bobby sitting on Mark's shoulders. I got up, spitting curses as the two boys separated, flustered and thoroughly upset. I was getting ready to give them a piece of my mind when a new scream split the air. It wasn't the usual deep-throated howl of the cave, and it certainly wasn't the cry of some animal. Instead, it was a child scream, and in it was held all the fear and hopelessness of a child's life before he comes to learn that the real monsters are the ones that walk on two legs. It was Reggie's scream, and without thinking, the three of us began to run towards it. We found Reggie sitting on the cave floor in much the same way I had been a minute ago. He was crab walking backwards, his sneakers making little rubbery scuffing noises on the ground as he tried to climb the far wall. As I ran up, I caught a whiff of a weird smell that wafted around the small chamber. Some metallic odor that became known to us when we finally came up to where Reggie was. Kyle's body hung limply from the cave wall. Someone had cut his throat for him and then opened his stomach down to the groin and let his entrails fall out like long ropes. Someone had pushed him against the wall. The red drag marks as he'd slumped proved that, and his clothes were soaked with red, sticky blood. The three of us took a few steps away from the body, and then did what any boy our age would do, given the circumstances. We ran. The earlier trip from the camp to the cave took about 30 minutes, but I'm pretty sure we got back to the campsite in under 10. I'm still a little dazed as to how we got out of the cave so fast. As we reached the familiar tents and fire pit, though, we collapsed into huffing piles of winded flesh. Reggie began throwing up noisily into the fire pit. None of us commented on it. I felt like heaving myself, and Bobby looked like he might start throwing up or crying any minute. I guess seeing your friend gutted like a trout is a little different than drowning kittens in a sack, isn't it, Bobby? We... We need to tell someone, Reggie huffed as he wiped the vomit from his shiny lips. Bobby sat up and moved towards Scoutmaster Mike's tent again. He still hadn't emerged from it, and it was getting on about midday. That fact had started to scare us. Bobby pushed on the tent flap, but it was still locked from the inside. We all started pushing on the tent and yelling for Scoutmaster Mike to get up and help us, but he never even stirred inside his fortress of canvas. Bobby became angry as his shoves and screams failed to rouse the Scoutmaster and went off to our tent to get something to cut it open with. Five minutes later, he came out even angrier. All right, which one of you assholes stole my knife, he asked, his red face starting to darken as he rounded on all of us. I bet it was you, Wedgie, he said, pushing the fat boy down so he could tower over him. I bet you were the one that killed Kyle too, didn't you? You were the one who screamed... You were the one who found the body, and I bet you stole my knife so you could pin it all on me, didn't you? Bobby was screaming at him now, and Reggie's sobs had a distinctly scared tone to them. I stepped between them as I had before, before the fight could escalate any further. This isn't helping, Bobby. We need to get Scoutmaster Mike up so he can call the police and get some help out here. Bobby turned his attention to me, and I wasn't sure that I wanted it. And how do you suggest we do that, huh? He's probably got his earplugs in again, so the creepy crawlies don't crawl into his brain while he's asleep. You remember last year, right? He slept through the whole jamboree because he got drunk the night before and put the plugs in. I did. Scoutmaster Mike was pretty well known for getting drunk and sleeping through his duties, but we still needed him, despite his shortcomings. 
We tried to cut the canvas with our scout knives, but it was a slow process. While Bobby had brought his father's old buck knife, probably a piece of steel sharp enough to shave with, our scout knives were dull little things that barely fit the arts and crafts we did. Finally, after ten minutes of hacking and digging, we worried a hole in the side of the canvas and let out an odor that smelled strangely familiar. Scoutmaster Mike was in there, all right. He'd been done the same way Kyle had. His throat cut, his entrails spilled out, his face a mask of terror and disbelief. We all flinched away from the tent in unison as the hole exposed the grisly scene within. With nowhere else to run from this awful scene, we went back to our tent and zipped the door shut. We all huddled in the corner as far from the zippered opening as we could get, and at that moment, all past feuds were forgotten, all past crimes were forgiven, and we were in that instant a united force. I'm not sure how long we sat there shivering, but it was creeping towards evening when Reggie moved towards the cooler to get something to drink. His moving seemed to break the spell over us, and suddenly we were all preparing for dinner or getting water bottles and granola bars. I pulled out my map as we ate and set it between us. Okay, so here's where we are. The road is miles from our campsite. The cave is a half a mile back that way, and there's a ranger station half a mile past it that's at the Appalachian Trail marker. Someone should go to the road and see if they can flag down a car while someone else goes to the ranger station to see if they can get help. The others will stay here at the campsite, so we have a safe place to come back to. Whoever stays here should stoke the fire and be on the lookout for whoever's doing this. Two kids against a murder? That sounds like a death sentence to me, said Bobby. You got a better idea? I asked. And he shook his head grudgingly and said he didn't. We, we should go check Mr. Mike's tent, Reggie said, his voice becoming a little less sure as we all turned to look at him. I just, I mean... He has that old bag phone. He has the keys to the truck, so we might... I don't know. He might have something that can help us. It's not a bad idea. I conceded. Decided to make my first stop, the abattoir of Scoutmaster Mike. It was becoming shadowy as we ripped the tent open and stepped in. The smell of blood was everywhere, and Scoutmaster Mike lay in his sleeping bag like an overripe pea that has burst its pod. We tried our best to ignore him as we went about taking his stuff, but it's hard to ignore a dead body that's less than five feet from you. Flies had gotten into our hole we had made earlier, and they were crawling along him like tiny mourners at his gaping neck and chest wound. If Scoutmaster Mike believed in hell, I could assume that this was it for him, his body flush with crawling insects while he lay powerless to stop them. We opted to take his things out into the fresh air of the campsite. Scoutmaster Mike had an odd assortment of gear, a compass, a fire starter, a Swiss army knife, which Bobby took, a flask of something alcoholic that was half empty, a cooler that was equal parts lunch meat, deli cheese, and beer, some rope, a faded magazine called Bazoons with a busty topless girl on the cover, his car keys, a hunting knife, and the bag phone, though, were nowhere to be found. Had the killer taken them so we couldn't call for help? Why kill Scoutmaster Mike and not kill us immediately? As we sat in the dying light of day, the howling started again. It was loud and mournful, cutting across our nerves like a knife. In our current state, it was enough to leave us shaking and unsure. It stopped after a few minutes, but a low grumble of it could be heard afterwards if you listened hard enough. As the sun went down and the howling grumbled at the edges of our hearing, I could almost believe that the woods witch, and not some murderous psycho, was responsible for all of this. Almost. I'll go to the ranger station, I said, getting up before I could think better of it. Bobby, why don't you go to the road and try to flag down a car, and see if you can find someone to help us. Mark, Reggie, you guys can stay here at camp and keep the fire stoked. I should be back in two hours tops with help. Sound like a plan? I had expected a token argument from Bobby, but it never came up. He just nodded, slipping the knife into his pocket and going towards the road. Reggie begged to go with me, but I told him to stay here with Mark and keep watch. He didn't fight me on it, but he slumped off dejectively to sit on a log by the fire. With a nod to Mark, I set off for the ranger station. Like I said before, the trail to the cave is clear enough for a blind man to follow, but I didn't want to get anywhere close to that cave if I could help it. I took the trail until I could see the heading for the cave and 
then broke off into the woods. I was trying to link up with another trail that went to the ranger station, but I must have gotten turned around because I found myself back at my original entry point after several minutes of scrambling through the woods. That's when I heard the howling again. I don't know if it was proximity to the cave or what, but for just a few seconds, I don't remember being able to hear much besides the wailing that cut through the quiet night. It drove me to my knees as its pitch became higher, and as I glanced around, it seemed like that wail was coming from the trees itself. Thunder rumbled overhead, and it lit up the night for a momentary burst in time. I found my feet as the howling ebbed a little, and realized that it wasn't the howling moving the trees, but the wind. A storm seemed to be brewing, and as I tried to find my bearings in the deepening dark, another fork of lightning split the sky. The flash was bright enough to illuminate a figure not five feet away from me. I added my screams to the howling as the hunched and twisted creature was once again hidden by the tangle of forest. In the ebb of the howling, I could hear it creeping noisily towards me. As the lightning peeled again, I got a brief glance of a steely blade in its hunched hands, and I trembled. It had a knife, the knife it had likely used to kill Kyle and Scoutmaster Mike, and if I didn't get out of here, it was going to kill me too. That's when I ran. Turned tail and ran, and when I hit the trail I had left behind, I kept right on running, losing myself in the woods. I have no idea how far I ran, limbs whipping my face and branches cutting my legs, but it was well and truly dark by the time I found the stream. I crashed into it like I heard a buffalo, and my feet snagged on a rock as I stepped in. I fell, tumbling over in the cold water of the shallow stream, and cut my forehead on a jagged bit of rock. I came up sputtering, hand going to my forehead to staunch the blood, and as the lightning flashed again, I saw something in the water. A neat little package was submerged in the sluggish current of the stream. It was wrapped in fabric of some kind, and I realized that it was a pair of scout shorts as I unwrapped it. They smelled awful, but the river had washed them somewhat and left them soggy. Inside the shorts, however, was the Motorola bag phone Scoutmaster Mike had brought, and the keys to his truck. Both had been drenched by the river, but the keys had been banged around and bent up. I doubt they would even fit the ignition of the truck ever again. I stared at the things for a second, puzzled as to why someone would do this, when I realized the shorts were too big to belong to anyone but Reggie. Why steal Reggie's shorts for this? That's when I heard someone screaming close to the river, and I realized how close to our campsite I was. I could see the shadowed hulk of our tents, and though the camp should have stood out like a beacon with its roaring fire, the flames had guttered and the camp was bathed in shadow. A drop of rain hit my forehead as I stepped into camp, and a lightning flash lit up another body sitting next to the fire. In a brief spark of light, I was certain it would be Reggie. His protruding guts opened and overflowing. As I came up beside the dying fire, though, I could see that it was Mark. He'd He'd been done like the others. I felt tears on my face as I knelt beside him. Mark was a shit like Kyle had been a shit, but they were still kids. Kids aren't supposed to die like this. Kids are supposed to languish in the idea of immortality until we realize in our teenage years just how fragile we are, which brings about adulthood. No child out on a camp out should have to face the idea that his life might be bled out next to his cook fire. And Mark was certainly no exception. Mark had wanted to be a baseball player, a dream a lot of little boys have. Though I didn't know him very well, I felt like certainly he deserved better than this. When someone suddenly grabbed my hand, I felt my bladder let go as I pissed my pants. Mark's hand was slick with his blood, but he clung to life even as it leaked out of him. His breathing was jagged and watery, but he seemed determined to impart some wisdom before he died. He put his other hand on the torn opening of his throat and croaked out a single word. But Bobby. Bobby? Bobby did this to you? But Mark shook his head in a small jerking way. Bobby. Gone. Reggie. Cave. When. Help him. He sputtered out the last with a gout of blood as he flopped back lifeless. I sat with him until he died. Then I made my way to Howling Cave. I didn't want to go to Howling Cave. It was the last place I wanted to go, but if the murderer had Reggie or Bobby, I felt like I needed to help them. That's what you do when someone's in trouble, after all. I didn't feel like a little kid anymore. I didn't feel like 
I sometimes did when I pretended to be a superhero or some other things for a game. I felt like the kids in those adventure books I read. I felt like I felt like I had to do the last thing I wanted to do. And if it meant the monster was to be killed, then it was me that had to go do it. The rain fell on me in sheets as I got close to the cave's mouth. The wind picked up, and as the trees shook and danced, the howling scream cut across the forest in a high crystalline note. I wondered as I went in if there was a woods witch waiting for me in there. Some boogeyman that I could blame all of this on instead of some hardened psychopath with a taste for murder. I doubted it, but I almost hoped for a witch as I came to the mouth of the cave. Kids and stories tend to fare pretty well against witches in the end. It was pitch black inside, but I had a flashlight. My beam found an easy trail to follow almost immediately. Someone had left bloody sneaker prints on the cave floor, and I could only hope that it wasn't on purpose. I crept along through the tunnels. As I went, I began to see signs of a fire up ahead. All of a sudden, the howling raced across me again, and I covered my ears to block it out. It was louder than I'd ever heard it, an otherworldly wail that made me want to fall down and cry. I moved towards the fire, always towards the fire, and it led me to a small chamber near the very back of the cavern. A placard on the wall declared that this was the witch's hobble. I suspect that it had been set up after the legend got popular. There was a cauldron, some shelves along with some old books, a cane broom, and... Bobby! My flashlight found the back of the scout shirt as I moved closer. Someone had leaned Bobby Terry against the corner like a naughty child. There was a standing pool of red around him, and I didn't even need to flip him over to know that he was long gone. He was on his knees, face pressed against the stone. I saw my hand reaching out to turn him around, and I pulled it back before I could have another murder etched into my mind forever. I heard footsteps behind me then, and flipped around to find the last person I'd expected. Reggie? He smiled at me, and my flashlight glinted off the knife in his hand. All things considered, he was really none the worse for wear, though the blood stains on his uniform looked fresh enough to make me think he'd gotten wounded. When the howling started again, I looked up towards the ceiling and felt stupid for ever being afraid. The placement of the hovel in the chamber was pretty smart on someone's part, because the chimney-like opening at the top of the cave made the howling sound I'd heard when the wind blew across it. The howling and the wailing had been nothing but a big bottle for the wind to blow across. The revelation distracted me from Reggie, and it almost cost me my life. I was honestly hoping you'd make it out. You're the first person in this situation that's ever been genuinely nice to me, and I appreciate that. I really do, he said before snaking forward and trying to slice me with the knife. I stepped back from him. The blade cut a long gash in the front of my uniform, but never hit the skin. I took another step back and analyzed this new Reggie. This wasn't the soft-spoken, scared little boy from the camp who pissed his pants and shrunk from bullies. This Reggie was a competent, crafty creature who waddled less and stalked more. He looked at me like an artist who's sizing up marble for his next sculpture, like a painter who's trying to winkle the next masterpiece from his canvas, a writer wheedling the next bestseller from the aether, or a predator contemplating his next meal. I thought about running but he was blocking the only exit. I could juke around him, maybe, but he'd proven himself to be very quick already. I found myself backing up, Reggie walking towards me with all the ease of a B-movie slasher. Suddenly my heels struck something on the floor, and I tripped. I cursed myself mentally as I fell, and Reggie stalked in, easy as you please, as I crab-walked backwards. Why, Reggie? Why would you do this? Reggie seemed to think about it for a minute. Because I can. The knife opened up my stomach in a single slash. And... And as his entrails spilled out, the witch laughed and laughed, having claimed yet another victim. The police would later find the bodies of the scouts and their scoutmaster, but no sign of the weapon or the killer would ever be discovered. To this day, they say you can hear the witch's unearthly howl on quiet nights and those who sleep within her woods may find themselves to be her next victim. 
The campers sat around the fire with big moony eyes as I finished the story, and they all glanced around as the fire crackled, trying to get a glimpse of the woods witch before she got them. The woods suddenly caught a pine knot, and the loud crack made all of them jump before laughing at their own jitters. The seven scouts, none of them older than I had been when I first stepped into the woods, discussed the story in low whispers amongst themselves. A pudgy, freckled-faced scout with the unfortunate name of Davy spoke up just as I thought they were all about to settle in for the night and drift to their tents. Scoutmaster Lawson, is there really a woods witch? One of them, a tow-headed kid named Ken, who reminded me a little of Bobby Terry, guffawed loudly and made a rude noise. <laughs> little Davy's scared of the woods witch. It's just a story, Nimrod. Actually, my own scoutmaster told us about the woods witch when I camped in the woods. It's a local legend that's supposed to have some historical fact. Though I doubt she still lives anywhere around here, I said. Davy looked a little relieved as he put another marshmallow on his stick and held it out over the fire. Thanks, Scoutmaster Lawson. Call me Reggie, I said, smiling. All my friends used to.